Once upon a time, some believe around the year one double out three. So it's uh, very interesting this creation story pulls all these elements out and that Hans Bellamy was able to, to put this together. So he says, the antediluvian shore dwellers seem to have been quite aware of the impending disaster and fully prepared for it. Some of them even built their arcs on high ground so as not to have them dashed in pieces on the shore when the first huge breakers of the deluge rushed inland. They waited for the waters to rise and carry their well-appointed vessels away. The only reason I wanted to mention this, that Hans Bellamy did, is because I've told you guys in the past that the story of, of Noah and only eight souls, it, it's, it's a part of an ancient syllabus. It's where the Egyptians got their Agdoad. It's the reason why uh, this ancient syllabus was taught by, by the Amuru, and they spread it to all these different areas of kings, but it's not true. It's not true that only one ark survived. Hans Bellamy knows it's not true either. It's right here. Many people knew that this was coming, the Phoenix, and they prepared for it, and many arcs made it. And that's how our world was repopulated. Not by one, but by many. So we're talking about whole fleets. Again, we're, this is a hint that things I've been telling you guys is true. We were technologically advanced before the flood. We were able to prepare, project, see all these things. We were probably running simulations then. Gotta love Bellamy, guys. He says the Arawaks of British Guana say that the wickedness of mankind so enraged him who lives on high. Ioman Kandi, I guess that's in the name of God, that he twice ordered a general destruction. First, he scourged the world with fire, and then he flooded it with water. A few men, however, however contrived to escape from each catastrophe. They found refuge from the fall of fire in underground caverns. While at the time of the Great Flood, the ancestral chief, uh, Marijuana, <laughs> it almost sounds like marijuana, and his followers were able to escape in a canoe. A flood of fire preceded the Great Flood, and there's a distance in time between these two events. Phrygia, it's Turkey today. I don't know, you could call it, it's, go, it's gone, that area of the world is gone by so many different names. Lydia, Lydia, Phrygia, Turkey, Hittite, Anatolia, it's all the same area. That's where the 60 underground cities have been found since 1962. And remember, I told you in prior presentations, there is a legend that, that we have preserved of a king called Anikos who foresaw coming calamity and he built a city under in the underworld and he hid his people in it to save them from what was going on on the surface. Legies. My own commentary is insufficient to convey the magnitude of the following passages, so I'm going to read them to you word for word. What an overwhelming and truly grandiose spectacle the capture of Luna must have presented to the beholder. One must picture the brightest of stars, far outshining Venus at its best, drawing nearer and nearer, increasing night after night in brilliance. On the eve of the capture, it appeared as a dazzling disk of, say, one-eighth of a degree in diameter. And that disk began to grow, and grow before the awestruck spectators. It suddenly increased to twice, four times, eight times, sixteen times its size. At its capture, Luna must have had, for a short time, an apparent diameter of at least one degree, doubling the width we know now. But how closely the grand is related to the terrible, the teeming population of the lost lands, of whose shining cities all that has remained is a distant gleam in myth and fable, having crowded out of hood and palace and temple to witness the heavenly marvel suddenly felt an icy fear, a nameless terror. The air was full of forebodings. An unknown god had revealed himself before their very eyes in magnificence and splendor. A sudden shock sent the trembling crowds to their knees. A series of tremors and throes flung them prostrate, groveling in the dust. And from above, from below, from all around, came a thundering, rumbling, roaring, raging voice, uttering great words in a dark tongue. The houses heard it and crashed. The trees sh uh, shivered into splinters at its accents. The hills reeled and, and bowed their heads at its sound. The earth opened its womb and fire flashed forth. Blinding dust storms swept over the stricken multitudes. But the measure of their affliction was not yet full. Now the end came on. There rushed from north and south, advancing on a broad front, mountain-high waves, walls of water steeply reared. They swept over the land, seething, surging, tumbling, tossing, raging, roaring, burying all proud prince, crafty priest, harmless citizen in one deep, wet, cold grave. 
A few, very few, escaped. A man, perhaps, out of many thousands. The, the point he's making is that when a cataclysm of this magnitude happens, it's a total infrastructure collapse. You're too busy trying to eat and shelter yourself to, to, to do, doing anything else. And if the infrastructure is collapsed, you can't make tools. Yeah, all you can do is make the most primitive tools. You can't make the tools that are really effective that will continue some type of infrastructure. You're going to make sticks and stones. That's all you're going to have. You, you're not going to be able to mine metals. You're not going to be no metallurgy, no smelting, no casting, not turning it into make the type of tools that you need. This is what he's describing. It's it's a it's very it's very realistic that a, that a total infrastructure collapse always follows a major cataclysm. If I imagine that a great and sudden cataclysm overtakes this busy hive of London or the swarming canyons of New York with the villages and hamlets of England, the backwoods settlements of America, and an un unimaginably great and powerful tidal wave sweeps me and a few of my neighbors, a sorry crew with nothing to call our own except the shirts on our backs, to some strange place scoured clean by the raging waters, where is now our learning, our technical skill, our standard of culture? Though I may still remember a number of mathematical formulae, historical data, and general facts of what value are they to me. Though I can make things out of wood and metal, unless I have the materials and the tools necessary, I can do nothing. Soon the, pang, the pangs of hunger tell me that I am really alive, and I have to roam far and wide to pick up a few awful things, or the carcasses of drowned animals if I'm lucky. These I must hammer at with stones to get through the skin, and then I swallow some of the pounded raw flesh. This is, this is very, it's graphic, but he's explaining in detail here what we experience in the human family by these cataclysms. Unless you're in the underworld, you cannot maintain your infrastructure. This is why the elite go down there. This is why we have those facilities. Not all of them are going to make it, but the ones that do have their engineering. They've got factories down there. They've got gardens. They've got light. They've got food. They can continue civilization. In the apocalypse, a myth has been preserved, which tells us that there was a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Okay, he's quoting the book of Revelation. He's quoting the end book, the book of Revelation. He's making inferences throughout his entire text, Hans Bellamy is, is that the book of Revelation is only talking about a past event, an event that happened in the ancient world, and that that event happens repetitively therefore the prophecy is actually scientific a lot of things have been have been attached to it which he which he discusses but although he believes the book of revelation is describing a past event he admits that it's inferring a future event right here a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea the loop has re has begun again we're going right back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis cha in Genesis chapter 1, here it is, new heaven, new earth, year 1, Annus Mundi. It all begins anew. The whole Adam and Eve narrative, the whole story I just told you about, Eve and Lilith, all this begins again. This is just the beginning of Bellamy's stuff. Like He says, in all deluge myths, whether of the eastern or the western hemisphere, whether told by peoples living near the poles or by tribes settling in the tropics, one fact always stands out. The Great Flood appears as the conclusion of a universal catastrophe, as the finale of a great cosmic drama. But though it definitely closes a period, it does not cause the final end of things. After the deluge comes the creation. He says, after the Great Flood, men were found no more. The hills and valleys were covered with a fine loam and loess, a legacy of the dead satellite, which was recognized as being a new, unfamiliar thing. Its brownish or reddish color all over the ground was taken as evidence that it was the material into which the dead had been transformed. So this cataclysm occurs in ancient times. Something breaks up in the sky. It rains all over the ground and the survivors see this red mud. They see this everywhere and in their minds, this is what happened to their moms and dads and brothers and sisters and wives and husbands. What's left over after this cataclysm, all the people are gone. The people are gone when what's left is all this fallout, red fallout from the sky.
He goes into Peruvian legends that talk about the Great Flood, and he shows that in those Peruvian and ancient American legends, the Great Flood is very similar to the one in the Bible, like the Flood of Noah. It is totally dissimilar to the to the massive flooding that happened when the moon appeared. Two different two different events. He said that the Great Flood of the ancient Americas it lasted for five days in which the entire time the sun was obscured and i've showed this in my own research that the great flood in 2239 bc the sun darkened which is a part of the phoenix phenomenon this is very very intriguing remember phoenix brings this thundering humming coming from the sky that vibrates all kinds of physical objects yeah causes liquefaction all that stuff so it's calling a peppy a peppy phoenix typhon set it's all the same same phenomenon uh, it's all described in ancient texts as being the very same. They are all they are all just epithets for the phoenix. Bellamy goes into a lot of detail that Genesis 1 describes a cataclysm and the renovation, the healing of our world after a total destruction. Something that I've told you many times and in many presentations provided you my own evidence. Bell Bellamy spends a lot of time explaining this and how it relates to Genesis and Revelation. He says the snow mentioned in the above passages is, he's talking about the book of Ezekiel and other, pro, other prophecies in, in, in eschatology. He says the snow mentioned in the above passages is really the wreckage from the old shattered firmament, which is professedly built, professedly built of terrible ice. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 22 and various Jewish myths. He says the revelation of John contains the words, a door was opened in heaven. And then he goes on to ex explain that the word heaven, uh, Aronos, is descriptive of a great covering, a great, a, a, a great shell around something else, a covering. I don't know. This, is, this, this intrigues me because of my research into other areas and other ancient uh, enigmas. These... These eyewitness accounts also in the Bermuda Triangle when the sky corkscrews and they and they and they have a feeling they're looking at a door. I said, wow, here's a door in reality. It's perfect because the clouds, the ocean, the horizon, everything starts corkscrewing as if it's totally artificial. And that they're looking at an image and the whole image just starts contorting and it corkscrews. And and the and the general impression of some of these pilots is that I'm looking at a door in the sky. And and, and the door was was cloaked and it was cloaked by the very reality around us and so when i so if i i have to accept their their testimony is true when you read so much of it and they don't have any other i mean these people have put their credibility on the line some of them have lost their pilot's license for for coming forth you know coming uh, uh out with a lot of these things so uh, i accept that is true that many people have seen this because there's too many testimonies so if that's true i, I hear this about uh, John sees a door was opened in the heaven. It kind of makes you wonder now, were there portals that allowed the vapor canopy to collapse? Is he talking about a portal out of the simulacrum, or is it just another layer of the holography, one that we can't perceive? Just random. Here's about eight, eight or nine random things in the book to demonstrate his erudition how knowledgeable the man really was about the ancient world. He says the Mediterranean must be regarded as a very young sea because of the remarkable seismic and volcanic activity which we find it in its basin. Remember guys, I've, I've, I've cited the archaeological reports on my channel and the books of David Hatcher Childress. There are over 200 stone cities buried underwater in the Mediterranean. I have, I have videos that explain that the uh, Mediterranean was created in a day. In a day, when the, when the Strait of Gibraltar broke at the Great Flood in 2239 BC, that Walter Pittman and William Ryan are absolutely wrong about their Black Sea flood date. They're almost precise in all their archaeology up until the, up until the time they dated it at 5600 BC. They're off. They're terribly off. And it's easy to show by the artifacts that are found because they're contemporary with the 24th, 23rd, and 22nd century BC artifacts that are found and demonstrated uh, in, in, uh, in, other, in other areas local that were not flooded. So uh, aside from that, I, I love their theory because it's absolutely true. All the damage on Malta, how gigantic megalithic blocks were strewn all in one direction. A tsunami came from the west to the east and blew it all apart and ended Malta. That's what the, the Great Flood ended Malta all those great you know huge temples like hypogeum and all that so to find that bellamy 
was mentioning something like this is really shocking. I think, I think there's another one, yeah. The Mediterranean was not in existence at that time. In its place, there was a number of small seas or huge lakes, probably three in number. Again, blows my mind because it's true. The Mediterranean Ocean is a new, it's a new sea. The Mediterranean Sea, the Aegean Sea, Tyrrhenian Sea, uh, all that is absolutely new. Those were valleys full of people when that area flooded. So the Roman writer Claudius uh, Alien, he, he calls him Alienus, but that's, that's Latinized. Claudius Alien, in his Varia Historia, a collection of rare and curious lore, tells us that the Greek historian Theopompus of Chios mentions a talk between King Midas, the king of Phrygia, and Silenus, in, in which the latter speaks of the existence of a great continent in the outer sea. Its inhabitants, the Meropes, were the builders of large cities. A lot of people believe that this is a reference. I've read, the, I've read all these little citations from Theopompus. Uh, Theopompus was, was awesome. Uh, Theopompus also told us that the, one of the first ages was 3,000 years. And uh, he was dead on accurate. 5239 BC, the beginning of the Anunnaki Nerd chronology, is precisely 3,000 years before 2239 BC when the Phoenix appeared and caused the Great Flood Cataclysm. Theopompus is dead right. Uh, Theopompus, a lot of people think Theopompus' reference here well, is an is a ancient reference to the Americas because at that time, the Americas were teeming with cities. They had not yet been destroyed. 31 BC had not happened yet. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, be it's a beautiful thing that Bellamy was aware of these things. And here's another one. Here's a shocker for those of you who have really been following the Archaics material. Here's a shocker. Hans Bellamy wrote that we also... We know also that an Assyrian period ended in the year 712 BC. What? 713 BC, what happened guys? Why am I a simulationist? Why do I hold so rigidly now to simulation theory? What happened in 713 BC that changed everything? And that couldn't have happened, but it did. We have all the proof in the world that it happened, but it couldn't have happened in a real Newtonian universe, in a real solar system. All the calendars changed, and yet nothing changed. It's, 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 it's amazing. I have several videos about 713 BC. Yeah, it's the year, it's the year the sun went 10 degrees in retrograde. 185,000 Assyrians wearing armor were vaporized by a flux tube, a blast from the sky. Yeah, it's uh, when all the calendars changed from 360 days a year to 365 days a year. And yet, the Nemesis X object and the Phoenix didn't change their periodicities. Nod. 
was not returned. Now, was it the intention of the Shaolin monk to insult Pai Mei? Or did he just fail to see the generous social gesture? The motives of the monk remain unknown. What is known were the consequences. The next morning, Pai Mei appeared at the Shaolin Temple and demanded of the temple's head abbot that he offer Pai Mei his neck to repay the insult. The abbot at first tried to console Pai Mei, only to find Pai Mei was inconsolable. So began the massacre of the Shaolin Temple and all 60 of the monks inside at the fists of the White Lotus. And so began the legend of Pai Mei's five-point palm exploding heart technique. Quite simply, the deadliest blow in all of martial arts. He hits you with his fingertips. Mm -hmm. 